Okay, let's start our last session today. Uh, we have uh, Jake uh, Kachapalia uh, talking today. Uh, he is uh, coming from Nebula Genomics. This is a company that uh, deals with privacy protected individual biomedical data. It's one of its co-founders is George Church, uh, professor uh, at Harvard Medical School and MIT, and some people call him father of synthetic biology. Um, Jake uh, is uh, dealing with business development at uh, Nebula Genomics, and prior to that, uh, he was employed by our favorite uh, sportswear company, ASICS. Uh, Jake, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, please reserve your, uh, please ask your questions uh, straight away. He doesn't want you to wait. Yes, please. Can everyone hear me okay? Seems like it's working great. All right. Um, thank you, Sergey. Uh, and thank you for having me here. Um, so I'm Jake Kachapalia, as Sergey mentioned, from Nebula Genomics, and we're building a decentralized marketplace for genomic data. And uh, you know, when it comes to uh, where I sit in the organization, I'm on the business development side, but I'm going to lay out kind of what our, our business model is and what the framework for use of blockchain is in, in our model. Uh, and when it comes to getting into the, sort of the details of what we're doing for cryptography and, and sort of more technical stuff, uh, I can attempt to answer questions if you have them, but uh, I can also offline, we can connect and, and get answers to questions if I can't answer them. So, um, as Sergey mentioned, I came from the consumer fitness, health and fitness uh, background before I joined Nebula, and uh, I've been watching genomics and, and sort of this idea of consumer genomics for quite a while now. There's a, a, quite a large movement happening, and I don't see them as like two very different worlds, although some people do. I think there's actually a very big convergence of like how people are managing their health, and genomic data is one part of that uh, that whole pie. So, clicker. So George Church is a co-founder of Nebula Genomics. I feel really lucky to be working with George. He's been uh, a pioneer in the space for decades, uh, from the first whole genome sequence of a human. Uh, which costs something close to $3 billion and has been working really hard on driving down the cost of that. Um, and then Kamal, our CEO, and Dennis, Dennis is actually in the church lab, our co-founders with George. And uh, I, met jo I met Kamal and, and Dennis about a year ago, and we've been talking, joined the company full time in September. So I'm fairly new, um, but uh, I've been following along this project and genomics for quite a while. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. I feel really lucky to be working with George as well, since he's been you know, such a pioneer and inspiration. Uh, let me ask a question. How many people have had a, a, a DNA test done? Okay. Um, and you know, they're, 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 it's starting to kind of proliferate. There's lots of options. There's lots of sort of categories. There's some clinical, some non-clinical. Uh, obviously, the most popular are 23andMe and Ancestry.com. We're starting to see them uh, broadcast and, and do mass marketing on things like mainstream television, on billboards. They're, they're kind of in front of everyone. And so, so total uh, in, in the world, there have been about 15 million to 17 million. The numbers are a little bit uh, scattered. But 15 to 17 million people who have had their DNA sequenced. And that's you know everything from partial sequencing to whole genome sequencing. But the whole genome sequencing is a very small percentage of those people. And, and when we look at the world as a, as a total population, uh, it's a very, very small percentage of the total population. And to really do things on a clinical level and, and make true um, progress on precision medicine, we need a whole lot more people and a whole lot uh, more diverse set of, of people to do the things that we want. To do. And I'll get into that. So you can see some of, the, some of the headlines for 2018. It seems like there's always a lot of hype. One of the things that I'll mention is that in the last year, there was more growth in direct-to-consumer ad adoption than there has been in the previous three. So we're starting to see some, some exponential growth in the space, which is exciting as a new entrant. And then also on the other side is the cost. So um, we, we've seen a dramatic 
uh, decrease in the cost for whole genome sequencing. So a couple things to note on this, this slide here. Whole genome sequencing, it, it, we, we believe and I think is, is pretty well understood that whole genome sequencing, which looks at, at all, all of your, your entire genome versus this idea of genotyping, which is looking at either a specific section of your genome or, or particular SNPs, um, is, is, is on its way to kind of being the, the standard or is the gold standard and is on its way to um, having uh, this, this broad application. And the, the company Illumina, who, who produces the machines here in the United States, has sort of a stronghold or monopoly on the, on the space. Um, they, they produce the machines, and, and most of the, the highest or gold standard um, laboratories use Illumina machines. And, and they've, they've basically promised to, to have that cost somewhere around $100 in, in the next few years. So that's very exciting, but it's, it hasn't quite happened yet, and it's been sitting at this like just under $1,000 level for quite a while. Um, last two years. And then there's this pressure from, from other companies. Uh, Chinese company BGI is another main competitor in the space, and they uh, are also putting pressure on the manufacturers of these devices. The, the data quality is, is increasing quite dramatically for BGI machines. There's been historically some, some uh, questionability around the, their data, but it's getting better, and they're putting pressure on Illumina. So that's exciting as well. So. On, Illumina, sorry, on, on BGI machines, the, the price is down to somewhere around like $500, and uh, Illumina is somewhere around $1,000. Uh, another question, of the people who haven't had their DNA sequenced, uh, are, are, who, who's had concerns about privacy and, and costs? Or who in the room, if you haven't had it done, has, has not done it because of those things? And, and, and this is pretty true to what we found. I mean, we've, we've, we've been doing quite a, quite a bit of research on, on the space and trying to understand how do you increase the amount of genomic data that's available for research. And two of the, two of the, the loudest things that we've heard, uh, this was a, a, um, a sample that came in uh, for people who signed up for our service, um, about 1,000 people, and, and we, the, the indication was for sure, it's the price and the, the concerns about privacy that are, um, that are preventing people who want to or are intrigued by doing so, but haven't done it yet. Um, I signed up for 23andMe in 2009. I was an early adopter. Um, I, I didn't know really, the, the only thing that I wanted to do was get a little bit more information. I'd heard about like Angelina Jolie having, you know, having taken the test and uh, and, and they identified that she had a mutation that was related to breast cancer, and she ended up um, taking some preventative steps to, I think she had a double mastectomy, and, and ended up um, you know, taking those type of preventative steps. I was really intrigued by that and said, well, if I can understand more about, or get put more power in my hands to understand my health, then, then why not do so? The, the, so what I expected was I'd get some information about myself, and maybe some ancestry data and some things that I could share with friends that would be fun in a social setting. What, what I didn't know was that I was, um, I was consenting to a whole bunch of things that they were going to be doing on the back end. And I think that's, uh, that's been what's been in the, the sort of news lately, and I'll get into that in just a minute here. But I, I think I probably partially read the consent forms in terms of service like I do with pretty much any other service, and there's you know, this, this big story around Facebook and how they're using your data, and it's pretty much uh, all across the news right now as a hot button item where uh, you're, you're basically sharing your data with the service and so in some cases paying for the service. I paid $99 or $150 for this for them to go and then use my data however they, they wanted to, to go monetize. Um, so uh, th th this, this stuff all plays into kind of the model that we're building. A lot of activity for demand of genomic data. So there, there are major companies who are, who are in the space that are acquiring or acquiring access to the data. Um, so the, the, the most recent was uh, last year, a $300 million deal with GlaxoSmithKline and 23andMe, and that, that they heard a bunch of backlash on that one. Um, but there are a bunch of other examples on, on some more sort of open databases that uh, is, is showing promise for how genomic data is being and sort of enriched into the, the research process. But these are the headlines that we're seeing right now, and these are the problems that we're trying to address with what we're doing at Nebula. So uh, you have 
this idea of like making sure that people understand what's going on with their data. And you have these, this, this concept of like law enforcement subpoenaing databases for, for access to, to try to track down cold cases and things like that. In some cases, it's a good thing. In some cases, it's a bad thing. But um, tr truly, there's, there's a, a very fine line for making sure that people have uh, protection and privacy around their most personal asset, which is their genomic data. Um, and then some other things around um, the most recent sort of uh, encryption laws and things that we're seeing across the globe. Um, and then government controlled, like attempts to have government controlled genomic databases are, are somewhat frightening or potentially frightening if, if they end up getting large traction because it basically says that yeah, there's no, no real way for you to have a protected uh, version of your genomic data, and in which case maybe you shouldn't have it. And then and maybe, maybe you'll even get uh, targeted ads based on your genomic data at some point. There's been talk about that most recently. Uh, so the promise of personal genomics. Um, we believe that precision medicine is reliant on large data sets um, to apply things like machine learning. Uh, and in the genomic space specifically, uh, there, there's a few things that, that researchers would like to be able to do with genomic data and are, are kind of having issues with. One is um, disease prevention or, or, or treatment. And so that, that's you know, reliant on figuring out um, you know, sort of predispositions to certain uh, diseases. Uh, there's drug development and figuring out if there are ways to identify novel targets for new treatments and drugs. And then this whole concept of personalized medicine is that each person has a very unique um, way they may respond to a drug uh, a set of variants in their genetic code that, that may make them predisposed to something. And giving them a gene generic treatment is, is uh, something that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but it's what we're doing uh, in, in most cases today. And we're, we're moving in the direction of using this large scale genomic data to. Um, yeah, personalize and, and um, really customize the, the, the treatment. So um, the, the, the problem we see or the problem that we're addressing at Nebula is really kind of threefold. And we're, we're, we're not trying to tackle it all at once. We're trying to kind of take it piece by piece. But we see the pieces that are uh, kind of inhibiting the genomic data from getting to the researchers and from making this progress. The technology is in place. We have you know, lots of uh, really smart people working on models for um, predict, pred predicting you know, what, what, may, what variants may be related to certain diseases. But on the front end, there's a lack of data generation. And it has to do with this idea of like cost and privacy concerns that are causing friction. And, uh, and so that, that's one area that we're very focused on. And then data is extremely difficult to access. Um, there's, a, there's a major amount of fragmentation in sort of silos for genomic data today. So if a researcher wants to go do work, they have to be like having direct kind of tie-ins with a whole bunch of different places. And then uh, the, the, the management of data, these huge data sets that they're having to work with, are really inefficient. Um, and so that's, that's not necessarily today. This is like a thing that we see uh, that we, we, if we can solve the first two, we can get into solving that third as well. <clears throat> and, and, uh, and I'm getting into kind of the place where blockchain starts to make sense in, in our space as we see it. So you have this model where this is how the, the ecosystem looks today. You have owners of data on the left-hand side. You have middlemen who are or either you know, a, a private company, an academic institution, a hospital, you name it, a, a biobank that holds the data. And then the data buyer connects with those middlemen to acquire that genomic data set. The, the consent happens somewhere in the middle, um, and, it, and it makes it really inefficient. Um, so you have the, the data owners who are patients or consumers who are paying many times to get sequenced, either through the healthcare system or on their own. And then that data is then being passed to these research institutions for generally large sums of money. And none of that's being paid back to or compensated back to the individual. 
Um, and then the data buyers, um, yeah, like I mentioned, they have uh, fairly short access to large pools of data, at least sufficient enough to do what they want to do with them. And then the, um, the management of these, these, these sets of data. So you have a, 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 an extremely large file for one individual that has to either be ported over the internet, which is just not efficient today. So passing this data back and forth from institutions poses a lot of security issues, and as well as just like a pure time sink. So the solution that, we, that we're working on is um, one, access control. So giving patients and consumers the ability to access, to, to control access to their data. Um, and putting and, and sort of like really focused on patient centricity or consumer centricity. They, there should be no one that says they can access someone's genomic data without the consent of the individual. Um, and that's one strong area that we're tying in uh, the, uh, the blockchain sort of fundamentals. And then uh, easy data sharing is another where um, we, we don't think that there should be uh, we, we think there should be an, an ecosystem, not these individual fragmented silos, and so we're working on that. And then uh, I won't get into the data, data management, but there are other kind of ways of, uh, I'll talk in a few minutes about computing more centrally versus um, bringing data back and forth. So open and trustless system is kind of where blockchain fits in. We, we, you saw the previous model, which is putting the middleman Having consent happen uh, in a variety of ways, the consent happens from the data, the, the, the consumer or patient to, to the middleman institution, then the institution passes to the data buyer. We believe it should look more like this, where the holders or the um, folks that are the, you know, the, uh, yeah. not, not in control, but are, are the overseers of communities should uh, be part of an ecosystem, and there should be an openness for the transactions to be seen uh, across that ecosystem. And then for data buyers to connect directly with the owners of the data, not through a middleman. Um, and in a lot of cases, we want this to take place in a, in a way that um, it's, it's the individual consenting no matter where it's coming from. If you're using an individual's data, they should be the one consenting and saying that they're willing to share their data. And if they don't want to share their data any further, that they can, they can uh, also say that they'd like to turn off that consent at any time. And, um, and we want this to happen in sort of in parallel and uh, for data buyers to have a, a, an easy way to set up you know, a whole bunch of smart contracts to basically say, I, I want to access these, these uh, data owners information, if they're all willing to um, consent to share their data with this research study, then you know, it can happen in a, in a fairly quick period of time. So when, when we think about um, the idea of how, the, how this works in, you know, in just pure operational terms, it requires having uh, multiple key holders in multiple jurisdictions so that we can, um, we can be sure that we, Nebula, is, is actually not at the center of this. And so uh, I was just, we were just ch chatting earlier. We, we, we don't even want to have a copy of your, of your data. Uh, we, want to, we want the consumer or the, the, the owner of the data to be at the center. and. If we, as Nebula, want to do something with their data, we need to obtain a key to gain access. So we're in the early stages of developing this model, not fully baked, but um, the, the idea is that we have nonprofits that are part of our network who are residing over keys and helping us um, build this network. And uh, as we build out, there are lots of organizations in the nonprofit space and in patient advocacy who are already custodians of, of these communities of patients and uh, advocates. And um, we believe that those are great, great players who could participate in this ecosystem. Um, and then you know, for the researchers, we want to make sure that, that it's, it's super easy for them to uh, be able to interact with our service 
Uh, if you're a consumer and you come visit nebula.org today, it, it hardly looks like there's much in the way of like blockchain. You don't have to understand what's going on under the hood today, other than that you have your own private key and that at some point you may be able to um, monetize your data and, and that you are, are in full control. So we're, we're trying to do this as a really consumer friendly app and then for the, and, and in the same way, we want that to, to be true for the researchers. We don't want for them to have to jump over hurdles to understand the underlying technology. Um, and, and so you know, when you look at the service today on both sides, whether you're a researcher or uh, a consumer, uh, what you'll see is, is what you would normally kind of interact with as an experience on, on the web or a mobile app. Um, what, what I would say is, I don't think I get into, so we're, we're, we're not storing uh, genomic data on blockchain. What we are storing is, is some metadata, and then really its primary use case for us is this data access control. And, um, and, and that's purely for the, the, this concept of like a, a private company shouldn't own your data and shouldn't have control over it. You shouldn't even have a copy of it, especially genomic data. So in this case, you know, we're, we look just like any of the other nodes on the system, in the ecosystem um, in, in its maturity. Um, so there's a couple other pieces of the technology or the platform, and that's, uh, I'm not going to get into the details here, but basically you have, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, the, the clouds that we're using um, are, to the, to the consumer, look as if they were, would store uh, their data in, in any other cloud service, but it will be um, distributed storage. And then um, for, the, for the computing, as I mentioned earlier, what we're thinking is, and what we've been testing, is um, this idea of bringing the, instead of bringing the data to the actual computation, bringing the computation to the data. And so uh, instead of having large amounts of data passing back and forth, uh, there's this idea of having sort of um, uh, uh, the, the computation traveling. Um, and yeah, and so I think we, we, we do see a future potentially of, of monetizing with cryptocurrencies. Uh, I, I think we, you know, we have a ways to go before that happens for us. Um, but it, it by, by being integrated into a blockchain um, ecosystem, it makes it sort of a convenient Thing for us to do, and and uh, we're we're definitely considering it, but it but it's not for a bit. Um, and then yeah, so I was talking about the, the bringing the the algorithms to the data. We're working with a few different partners who are, are advanced in, in um, these sort of privacy preserving technologies, um, and the the idea of having multi-party computation happen on a data set is something that we're exploring as well, um, using like uh, distributed computing models and uh, trying to prevent the data from having to travel, uh, which, which, you know, in, in an encryption model that we have where, uh, you know, you, you don't have uh, this sort of access leaking and there's, there, there can be a more sort of secure uh, wall around the data. Um, so the the you know what what we see is definitely uh, first and foremost uh, using blockchain to have um, have a, a truly distributed model for people to own and, and control their data. We think that that helps um, if we can truly drive home this idea of like privacy centric um, genetic testing and putting the, the, the control back into a patient's or consumer's hands and not having them worry about where their data might go, that starts to like grease the skids for increased adoption. And uh, we're starting, you know, some of our first few thousand customers are coming in and, 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 and telling us that the, the purpose for choosing us over some of the other options is, is specifically for that. And, um, Making sure that, that that the control and ownership is fully transparent. If we have someone that comes in and, and has a request for their data, that they get notified for that, and they get to choose whether or not the data travels to that research institute. Um, 
and we believe that there's there's plenty of money to go around. Uh, we we will build a platform that we can monetize, but for for usage. So if there's a research institution that's uh, using our platform, they pay for the use of the platform, and if they're willing to um, one, since there's a huge need for the growth of genomic data, we think that the in the early days, a lot of what will happen is the researchers will end up funding the, the whole genome sequencing for a large part of the population because that that's the interest is is getting that done. So we think we can drive the cost down as as low as zero and get people fully subsidized on whole genome sequencing by by creating this model that's like peer to peer, uh, and and so we've started down that path and. Uh, and it's been really interesting to see. There's a, there's a huge number of people who are interested in this. And I think when you look at patients who have either a rare disease um, or uh, even just a, a, a hereditary disease in their family, they have a willingness to provide information. But the, the, the problem is that sometimes they're giving their information or giving their data to, or tissue samples in some cases, to a hospital uh, or academic institution or research group at a farm or biotech company, and they're, they're, one, not getting any communication back, two, they have a really hard time of retrieving their data back from them once they've had sequencing done or, or had a tissue biobank, and, and they, they're feeling like they're, they're uh, you know, being mistreated. And, and so there's a, a, a big shift happening around shifting the power back into the consumer and, and patient's hands. And so we, we think that uh, blockchain is a, a pretty convenient way for us to um, actually commit that to, to the patient or the consumer. And, uh, and we're, we're in the process of, uh, we've launched our consumer app so you can come in and get, get your um, low pass whole genome sequencing done and get some inherited trait reports and ancestry reports. And soon we'll be launching clinical grade sequencing with our partner Veritas. And, um, and so we're, we're on our way. Uh, yeah, and, and we, we're doing all this to, to, to continue kind of the growth of precision medicine by infusing and enriching um, this uh, genomic data. Into the, into the it's really powerful. And, and I think there's a, an agreement across the medical field that it's powerful when combined with a lot of the other medical data that, that exists. Thank you. How can we use it to, how can we, so I'll just repeat, how can we use blockchain to keep, uh, uh, so I think the confidentiality around genomic data, uh, it, it's really access control, because the confidentiality piece is, is, a, is a tough one with genomic data, because it's, it, it truly, like, once you have population level data, it, it, it's not, it, we're de identifying everything that we share with researchers as it is. So they don't get any personally identifiable information. But when you have population level data, the connections between individuals is uh, at some point uh, you're able to kind of track who's who. So um, I, I don't think, you know, we, we're using some other encryption mechanisms to protect the actual the actual data, it's not blockchain that's doing that. Blockchains we're using particularly for consent management and access control, not for the privacy of the data. So we'll, we'll be using some like um, proxy re-encryption mechanisms and potentially homomorphic encryption. We have, have some different ways that we're going to be encrypting the data or, or depending on the use. If it's being used by uh, a, a researcher, then they're, they're, they're likely not going to get a, a file they're going to be computing against against the data and getting an output in some form of like uh, uh, highest form of encryption that we can. Uh, we we haven't landed on uh, exactly. You know, I can I can share our white paper and it goes into detail about exactly how we want to secure the data. But uh, this is the idea right now.
Thank you.